So I would like to welcome all of you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody around the world. It is wonderful that you have taken the time from your busy lives to come and be here. And I think that that also marks the importance of this topic. All of us have had our lives changed irreparably from COVID. It's wonderful and that you have taken the time from your busy lives. <laughs> if everybody could just mute, that would be great. Thank you. But everybody has had our lives changed from COVID for the worse and ideally also for the better. I'm sure that we can all identify some silver lining. Around the world, we have family doctors who are really at the coalface of talking to people about how and about treating COVID. From this, we have a movement of Wonka, which is the World Family Doctor Organization. And within Wonka, there's the Young Doctors Movement, which is aspiring physicians, medical students, residents, and new attendings who from all over the world come together to build community, to share stories, to support each other in different research, to support the people coming through as medical students and residents, and more than anything, to work out together how best we can care for our patients. This amazing panel who you see before you are all from the Young Doctors Movement of Wonka. And they really have taken time out of their lives as well to talk about COVID, to talk about the ethics of what has gone on at this stage and to talk about integration, how we can move to the next chapter of our lives during and hopefully after the COVID pandemic has settled down. They are the thought leaders of the future and I am very excited to be able to introduce them to you. They will each have about six, seven minutes to present. And you'll hear me say it's six minutes and then at seven minutes we'll move on to the next one. And at the end, I would encourage you to post any questions that you have in the Q&A um, section that you see at the bottom. And we will address those questions after the first hour. So I really, with, without further ado, I want to thank Wonka. I want to thank the Young Doctors Movement. I want to thank all of the panelists. And most importantly, thank you all to our participants who are joining us from literally all over the world. Um, First, I would like to invite Osden Gokdemir, who is an MD, PhD, coming to us from Turkey. She is going to talk on safety, burnout, and suicide risk. She is going to now share her screen. Now, she is actually an expert in this area. So it's wonderful to see her and interested to hear what she has to say. Take it away, Osden. Thank you very much. Uh, I am from uh, Izmir, as uh, Margaret has just said, and uh, just working with Vasco da Gama from the Mental Health Week. Thank you very much. And these are my titles uh, just to talk about. And I just want to thank you, Margaret, uh, Sonia, Harris, and also our selected uh, chief, Nick, for just making us together. What is burnout? As you may say, there are lots of ways of being burned out, and we were just burning out before COVID. And so there was, let's think about the stages, the honeymoon phase that we just don't understand what was going on. And afterwards, it's just, just go to the habitual burnout. That just seems that everybody is so. This is important. This was the last VDGM face-to-face -face Congress it was not hybrid. And the, our members from equally different group has just made a workshop about burnout. And uh, the unpublished work just said that we were already has got the problem of burnout before COVID. And uh, this was again before COVID Congress, uh, because at that time uh, there was uh, in, in a week time, a mental uh, medical student, a practitioner, and also a surgeon has just committed suicide as died in Turkey at that time. And these were just before the COVID times. And we were just trying to talk about this on the workshop. So depression was our main uh, problem uh, in our uh, healthcare workers area. And also bullying for the ones who have got job is just still as a problem too. 
So with the COVID, what happens? First comes the ignorance. We just didn't want to see the problem. Afterwards, we just understand that it is not just come on with uh, just ignorance. We have to fight with it. And also not the ones on the front lines, but all of us has to fight with it because if not, we just can't get deal with that problem. By this way, we just try to get a review of the reviews, just see what's going on in the telemedicine, just not to see each other uh, face to face. How can we help to uh, us? At that time, we just figure out that not only for this time, but also after the COVID, if we can reach at that stage, we will have problems, emotional problems, not only for the healthcare workers, but also the communities, because these are just under the water, will just come to us on our faces. The other part is about the safety. We just have to be healthy to just protect the health. So not only protective equipment, but also the other things have to be needed. So the eagle eye observers are observing us if it's everything was going on for the contagious diseases and so on. Maybe we should get an eagle eye for our mental health too, just to check each other. So at that time, we just can see that there are lots of things happening, not only on individual side, but also in the planetary health side. The climate change has also affecting us for the contagious diseases, not only with the contagious diseases, but also the other factors. So our mental health is affecting. Have we got some tools to prevent this? Is community-oriented primary care could help us? Well, there are some tools about it. First of all, we just have to see the root reason. So the root reason for we had to define the reason. We may say that there are lots of people in the healthcare just the target of the suicides. And also not only the healthcare workers, but also the medicine, medical students are just need of help. So as we have got lots of hypotheses about suicides and how to, we can get prevent from that, we should see the risks about it. Most of the physicians are just committing suicides, not with bullets, but they are using drugs because they can reach it. The other part is just working together. If we could have some job, that means we, have, we, we should be happy with that. True, but bullying, mobbing, and the other factors are just coming with this too. So is it only a pandemic that we are living it or a symptom? Because economic burden has just comes to with these targets that we can't reach. And here we just became another window on the Zoom, not my, my, just like a mob show, just we can teach the touch each other and couldn't reach the human touch. So at that time, what could we do? Education could be one side to get the tools. The continent curriculum could be just taught. And the work and life balance could be a choice for us to do what we can do about our mental health. Let's think about core values, what is much more important for us and what could just say for us. So at that time, we should be just look our faces in the mirror too. So the options to be honest to us and also to just say that it is okay not to be okay. Okay, because we don't need to be well all the time while everything was just jung jungling down in this. We are just survivors. So the improvements, not only for the curriculum, but also for our uh, health is needed. I just want to thank you. Uh, this was just from a poem. I hope we will just meet each other in the sunny road after the COVID. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you, Austin. And I think that that is really that hits straight to the heart of so how so many of us and our patients have been impacted. And thank you for just being so authentic and talking about it as well. We need to talk about it more as physicians and as human beings as well. Um, so I think that that is fantastic. And again, if people have questions, please do not hesitate to put any questions in the Q&A box. I'm already seeing some come through, so that is fantastic. Um, and I would like to now invite Dr. Oteju Aramide, 
who is an MD from Sierra Leone, originally from Nigeria, now working in Sierra Leone, who is going to speak about access to care. Now, Dr. Otejo is going to um, try and share his screen um, as well. If we have any troubles, I have it here on my screen as well. I think it is phenomenal because we have seen how devastating Ebola has been in Sub-Saharan Africa. And now on top of that, we have really two pandemics, one of communicable disease and the other of non-communicable disease. So um, Dr. Otejo is on the forefront of that, working in Sierra Leone, and I want to welcome her and hand it over to her. Fantastic. So Dr. Ote, yes, you've got it, perfect. Dr. So Oteju, we can see your screen beautifully, but we cannot hear you. Is there a way that we, if you can unmute just at the bottom of your screen, see if you can unmute. See if I can unmute. Is, is that better? Okay, can you hear Perfect. me now? Yes, we can all hear you now. All right. So I'll start again. So I'm talking about access to care and how it has been affected by COVID. I'll be talking on the Sierra Leone um, pick, um, view, what we have, we, what we expected. So the WHO Constitution talks about access to care, and it's you know healthcare is supposed to be what a fundamental human right. So the highest attainable standard of health is a fundamental right of every human being. And that right of, to health means that everybody should be able to access the health services that we need when we need them and where we need them without suffering any hardship. All right? Quoting Dr. Tedros on that. So look at the, looking at the conceptual framework of access to health care by Levesque, you can see here what the factors that, um, that impact on health care and accessing it. So we have healthcare. So how, how do we reach the people? Okay. So access to healthcare basically is getting the health that people need to them when they need it and where they need it. And there are many factors in this. So we have the healthcare itself. Is it reaching the people? Is it available? So talk about it being, even being available. And then are people able to get to it? Whether by physically, talking about where the where are we? Um, how far away from the health um, care that you need are you? Is it from the health facility itself? Where do you live? Talking about the, uh, the acceptability, is it the kind of health care that you are willing to accept? You know, so talk about um, be, it being physically uh, accessible, financially accessible um, and appropriate towards you as well. Is it something you can accept? Is it the kind of health care that you're willing to, to believe in or accept as well? So we can see all of this, it's um, shown in this slide here. Healthcare, the perception of the needs for care. Do you think you need it? What's your healthcare seeking behavior? And then how the healthcare, how do you use it? Okay, so that's the basic framework there. So let's look at the Sierra Leone story. So Sierra Leone is a small coastal West African country. Our population is just about 8 million. Okay, and have a population growth rate of about 2.1% annually. Fertility rate is still quite high, 4.2, as it is in most middle, you know, low-income countries. Average life expectancy is 57 years. Maternal mortality, it was the highest, they had the worst, highest maternal mortality in year 2000, okay? And um, it's still high. Right now, we're in the top 10 at about 800 per 100,000 live births. Infant mortality is 70 per 1,000 live births. And the five mortality, also quite high. It's majorly more of a rural population, about 57% rural, and the median age is 19. Okay, so that's the flag of Sierra Leone right there. I am based in Kono, which is a major district in, in Sierra Leone. So Sierra, the capital of Sierra Leone is Freetown. Kono is the third largest, um, th third most populated district in, in, um, in Sierra Leone. 
Okay, so it's the center of diamond mining. And we all know the, the, that Sierra Leone is known for diamonds. That's one of the, some of the best diamonds in the world. And the diamonds have been both a blessing and a curse. It was one of the major reasons they had a, 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 a war yeah, about 20 years ago. And right there, Kono is the center of, of mining, a population of about 500,000. So right there, the center of mining, yet the health statistics are, you know, nothing to write home about. In the midst of so much wealth, we have just one hospital in the district, which is the Koidu government hospital where I am based, and then several um, primary health units Okay, peripheral health units that scattered over the 14 chiefdoms. So how did the first COVID wave came in about March 2020 to, and lasted about three months till June. The second wave was about December, January. Okay, and then the third wave was about from June till now. Let's look at some numbers to see how these affected, you know, the, the care given behavior <clears throat> and the care that was received by the community at that time. So let's look at the numbers. So these are the general outpatient department numbers of Koidi Government Hospital. Let's look at the number of patients. In 2020, just before the, the first wave of COVID we came in March, you can see the numbers, the averages were 1,026, 1,024, which is about what we saw, you know, usually, okay? Then it dropped, started dropping in March, 940. April, 508. In May, we had just 130 people in the outpatient. At, at, at the peak of the pandemic. Then in June, it started coming back up 377. And by July, by which time we were hardly seeing any more COVID cases, we started going back towards the normal um, output, uh, patients we were seeing. So if you look at that right there, you can see how it had affected it. So initially we we're having patients coming in, then the numbers of patients that were coming to the hospital dropped. Why? When there's a pandemic, we're starting to see more patients aren't we? But that was not what we saw. And after the pandemic, the number of outpatients rose again. Um, then there's a, one of the peripheral health units or the health clinics that we have also had a similar pattern, all right? So the peripheral health units are like um, primary health care centers that's you know, in those chief domes or local governments. So looking at the quarter, January to March, that was just before the pandemic, Last year, 2020, about 3,867 patients coming in. April to June, one around minute, the, 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 okay, June. We have one okay. minute, we're looking for it. 2,176, and again, it rose back again. So we see that. And look at the COVID control measures in the first wave were very strict and effective. I know, and because of the Ebola experience, a lot of people were complying to that. But the fear, oh dear, the fear of COVID like to go back there. The fear of COVID made a lot of people not come in for care. Okay, the fear of being quarantined made people not to come in for the care. And we see that happening. So we're having more COVID cases coming in, but fewer people coming accessing the, the, the care for other cases. And the numbers coming in, okay, for the third wave, it wasn't as much as this. We had slightly better um, um, Care because by this time people were wondering why was this? Is there was there increased confidence in the health system that they wouldn't come in and get COVID from the from the hospital, or was it there was a reduced fear of virus, or what could it be the vaccination? These are some of the things that we are looking at. Okay, so there was a lockdown. I talk about some of the factors, but this is just a picture of the fact that we are not even having enough health care. So this is a picture of a road right here. The kind of access already already had bad access to health care because of roads like this, some of the peripheral health centers, okay? And I'm looking at that. So I just get a picture of what we look at. So just some of the health centers where our sister organization, as a partners in health, helped us to get access to health, okay? So because of time, these are just how the, the road to where we're going there, right there, is it? So this is what the, the health center looks like before until the sisters, uh, organization came and helped us with that. That's me with some of our patients. And um, on behalf of AFRIWAN, Young of uh, Wonka Africa, I've talked about access to health care during the COVID and how it was affected. So we had less people coming in for access for other conditions aside from COVID related conditions. And then it, the numbers improved again. But we aren't having as much as a decrease in this third wave. So when we're, we're trying to find out what are the factors that affected that. Thank you. 
Wonderful. Thank you, Oteju. I think that you speak to um, all of our experience and yet it is so unique, your experience in Sierra Leone as well. That road brought back many memories of after the rainy season in sub-Saharan Africa. So I, I can only imagine the, the barriers that you are overcoming. And it'll be interesting to hear not only from our panelists, but also from the floor, um, what barriers are new for you that you have overcome in COVID. So please go ahead in the Q&A and um, if there's anything you want to talk about there and identify what barriers. So that was that was great. And any questions directly for Dr. Otejo, you can also post in the Q&A section. Now I would like to invite Dr. Kinley Bhuti, who is a general practitioner from Bhutan. Would you like to go ahead and share your screen, Dr. Kinley? She's also wearing the beautiful traditional Bhutanese um, top, which I thought was really lovely. And she is going to speak on underserved populations. All right, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I am Kinley Bhuti from Bhutan. Uh, I will be speaking on the topic underdeserved populations. Okay, so as per the definition by the health and human, uh, human services, it characterizes underserved, vulnerable, and special need populations as communities that include a minority population. And they, it says Latino population, African American population. It doesn't really say Bhutan or Southeast Asian. But then we have the, the individuals with limited English prof uh, proficiencies, young adults with the uh, education, uh, like unfinished education who do not have a coverage for health care, and also the women and the women with children and individuals with disabilities. So these are the definition as per health and as per health and uh, human services. So if I just talk about a little bit about my country, uh, Bhutan is a democratic monarchy, a tiny kingdom in, in between India and China. So why, why underdeserved? underserved because this uh, our country doesn't produce any pharmaceutical drugs or or vaccines so if i update a little bit about the covid situation in our country we have about 2500 cases as first as uh, for 6 p.m uh, today and we have two new cases detected in last 24 hours and two confirmed deaths in over uh, since the pandemic started. So how uh, the under, underserved population could cope up with COVID-19. So I would like to bring up how we had uh, coped up with the COVID pandemic. We further characterize the underserved populations. It means it's receiving fewer health services, encounters barriers to accessing the primary health care based on the geographical or economical and cultural barriers. And we also, the population also have a lack of familiarity with the healthcare delivery system and also face the shortage of the readily available providers, mostly seen in our neighboring countries in India and all. So there are various factors for the healthcare disparities. One is racism, the one is biasness and discrimination, economic and educational disadvantages. So if I talk about the three main categories where which increases the risk factor during the pandemic, it's number one is economic and social circumstances, assist to the testing and treatment and those population who have health uh, underlying health conditions. So since the pandemic began, it had uh, impacted much on the economic and social circumstances. It has lowered the median income uh, people where they have uh, reduced the livelihood uh, due to the health care coverage. And uh, because of the uh, deemed essential front uh, frontline services, and other many uh, frontline healthcare providers, we are uh, put at a much uh, greater exposure, risk exposure to coronavirus. And also because people do not have uh, much uh, paid sick leave, they do not come forward to get tested and all. So also the living in densely populated areas has hampered a lot in uh, in the, uh, controlling the spread of the COVID-19. So the number two, the risk factor is access to testing and treatment. The 
Number one, but, uh, most common barrier is the language and culture barriers. Our people still believe that there is some uh, evil spirit or something uh, hampering their health, so they don't come forth to seek healthcare, uh, healthcare and this until it becomes severe and then we cannot do much to them. So there's also, uh, this is one uh, long standing mistrust of the healthcare system. And uh, not uh, since healthcare is free in my country, not much, we don't have much problem with healthcare insurance, but it's seen in the you know, neighboring countries in the region. So the, the most uh, the uh, other important thing is the underlying health conditions. We have many population who live with uh, the non-communicable diseases like diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, and also like uh, HIV AIDS and also. So how to, uh, there are various ways that we have uh, put forward to protect ourselves. We uh, strictly follow the CDC guidelines and we, get, we got vaccinated. Uh, people practice uh, social distancing. They stay uh, home as much as possible. Hand hygiene is practice and then uh, uh, using a face mask is must for every thing. So, hello, am I audible? Okay, um, I thought I lost my lines. Okay, so Bhutan got its first vaccination from the government in the government of India. So our country went underwent a mass rollout vaccination after considering a special zodiac sign to fit the special auspicious day. Uh, it began on 27th of March this year, and we're supposed to get a second dose by end of the May or first week of June, but because of the various circumstances and situation our neighboring countries were facing, we were not able to get the second dose on time. But then we're very lucky that various uh, the nations of the country, they donated and then we received our second uh, dose of vaccination on 17th of this month. And our nation right now is undergoing the second mass vaccination campaign. So the various things that we, uh, that uh, we, we uh, practiced to cut the chain of the COVID-19 was a national lockdown where people, we see the town of uh, the capital city, Bhutan, where we don't see any anyone roaming in the town. And then the, the social distancing testing were all provided free of cost. And then to move forward, we have uh, the healthcare is located in a community where people don't have to come in a crowd. And then we also have the uh, uh, teleconsultation put in line where people can freely call in. So we have various flu clinics set, uh, set up away from the hospital to to uh, prevent the hospital from shutting down uh, from like so that we can isolate the people uh, at the right time at the right place and then isolate them before they actually get into uh, in the in uh, uh, the relation to other people so this was the various uh, and then people were reminded continuously on the radios and the national television how to uh, notify the symptoms of COVID-19 and the various uh, protective measures they should practice. So that's all. Thank you. That is really fascinating. Thank you so much, Kendi. And those photos are just beautiful as well, inspiring us to want to come. Also really interesting, um, you know, the, the vaccine story and just how dependent we are on supply chain and on um, access in different ways as well. So I'm thrilled that you've been able to get the second dose for so many people there. And thank you for your ongoing work there. I think that that is, um, I'm sure I can see the, the questions rolling in as we go as well. Um, and now it is my pleasure to invite Dr. Erwin Gustiawan Sawanto, who is a doctor and who is also a lawyer and who is also an LLM, to who is going to speak about the rise of telehealth. And it's a perfect segue because, as you saw, Kindi spoke about in Bhutan um, how they are going to do the flu clinics and do more telehealth. So I think that you know we have these amazing up and coming young minds. And um, Erwin, I want you to take it away with these next yeah. um, ideas. Yeah, thank you, Margaret, for your kind introduction. So we will discuss about telemedicine and its ethical response to COVID-19. I'm Ervin, I'm from Indonesia, and Indonesia is one of the epicentrum of COVID-19 infection nowadays. And it's a pity actually, but uh, we will just do our best. So you can see 
in this first slide, um, we'll, we will talk a little bit about industry 4.0. So uh, we know that the first uh, era is all about mechanical machine. And then the second era is all about electricity. And the third era is all about uh, internet. And now we are entering um, 4.0 era. So uh, it will be more complicated because uh, we will combine technologies and also uh, human resources with its complexity um, and especially in our society. And this is our uh, <laughs> online meetings and also online webinars. So uh, in Raja Kumar movement, one, one kind of specific uh, young doctors movement, uh, we have discussed a lot of things. The first one is all about entrepreneurship and the second one is about uh, clinical case discussion. And the third one uh, is basic medical research. And also we also did mental health and emotional uh, well-being sessions for young doctors in our regions. And this is the pandemic impacts on non-COVID patients in Indonesia. So uh, especially if we talk about uh, diabetes and hypertension and cancer. So 83.6% of our, our government primary care centers have decreased visit rate because of this pandemic. And 43% of government primary care centers have closed their basic services in community, including for geriatric services. And 32% decreased home visit by staff of our government primary care centers. And survey that is made by CISC and Indonesian Society of Respirology from uh, 355 cancer survivors in Indonesia. Uh, most of them are well informed about uh, COVID-19 protocol, but 60% are not worried about their disease during this pandemic. But almost 40% uh, are worried about their disease during this pandemic. And 38.8% are worried about the progress of their disease. And 29.2% are worried about the therapeutic process, uh, for example, long QE. And then 22.5% are worried about accessibility, for example, pharma stock. And data from National Health Insurance Agency, uh, there is decreased visit of cancer patients to hospital. And 9.7% deaths in Indonesia is caused by cancer. And this is the example from China, and we will, we will try to copy it this also in Indonesia. So uh, this is one of the um, uh, successful point from China. They use community residents and they combine health science, psychology, and consulting, update information on COVID-19 and online clinic consulting. And you can see that the telemedicine is the center of it. And they have screening, left and severe partiness, consulting and medical staff there, training, consulting, quality improvement, panel discussion, broadcasting, and also psychological. So uh, this, kind of system uh, can be copied in other countries actually. But uh, in Indonesia, uh, you know that we are democratic countries and we have a liberal economy system. So uh, it's hard to make a same system like this. <laughs> That's a problem. So we have uh, a lot of sporadic uh, online platforms, especially telemedicine platform. And I'm also starting my own startup companies in telemedicine. And this is one of the video that you can open by yourself. Uh, we have started our pilot project in India also, not only in Indonesia. So you can see the, the, this is the stages and layers in China. So uh, they, 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 they insist on primary care treatment and screening for COVID-19 patients. So uh, they can take all patients to be revert to the hospital. So the hospital, it will be, it will decrease the burden of the hospital. That's the point. And telehealth um, has been discussed in WMA or World Medical Association uh, Congress. So they, they make a difference between telehealth and telemedicine. Telehealth is, is the use of information and communications uh, technologies to deliver health and healthcare services and information over large and small distances. And what about telemedicine? Telemedicine is the practice of medicine over a distance in which intervention, diagnosis, therapeutic decisions, and subsequent treatment recommendations are based on patient data, documents, and other information transmitted through telecommunication systems. So telemedicine uh, can take place between a physician and a patient or between two or more physicians, including other healthcare professionals.
And the ethical recommendations from World Medical Associations are telemedicine should be appropriately adopted, adapted to local regulatory frameworks, which may include licensing of telemedicine platforms in the best interest of patients. And where appropriate, the WMA and National Medical Association should encourage the development of uh, ethical norms, practical guidelines, national legislation, and international agreements on subjects related to the practice of telemedicine while protecting the patient-physician relationship, confidentiality, and quality of medical care. And the telemedicine should not be viewed as equal to face-to-face -face healthcare and should not be introduced solely to cut costs or as a perverse incentive to over-service and increase earnings for physicians. And use of telemedicine requires the profession, sorry, to explicitly identify and manage adverse consequences on collegial relationships and rival patterns. And new technologies and styles of practice integrations may require new guidelines and standards. And physicians should lobby for ethical telemedicine practices that are in the best interest of patients. Uh, the biggest problem is that we, uh, it's, it is often that we can uh, address the emergency, emergency situations. And also we avoid to make fit call of, of, for the patients in fact, we should facilitate that fit call because even though there is no emergency situation, but sometimes the patients could feel very anxious. That's the point. And you can see that uh, if we talk about e-health uh, ethical problems, then we should focus on this area. So there is, there is application area about treatment, monitoring, communication and research and also user groups, adults, use elderly and dimension of individual, organizational and societal. And all of it, uh, of course, we will, sh we, we should uh, consider about the informational self-determination, confidence, privacy, data security, patient security, and justice. And we need a good leadership and governance to make a good uh, e-health system, especially telemedicine system. And the strategy investment also very important and services applications, standards, interoperability, infrastructure, legislation, policy, and compliance and workforce are uh, the main factors for the success of a telemedicine system. So the con conclusion, uh, currently there are still no official general guidelines available that may be applied to address these questions in practice. Given the broad application areas and it involves stakeholders, it will be probably impossible to formulate general guidelines for all possible uses scenarios. And for its application and research study, researchers and healthcare providers need to carefully weigh harm and benefit for the individual patient or groups of patients. And Indonesia has law uh, number 11 of uh, 2008, Electronic Information and Transaction Act, revised by law nine of uh, 2016, law 29 of 2004, Medical Practice Act and Medical Ethics Code. And also we have health minister regulation on telemedicine among health facilities and health minister regulation on teleconsultation during pandemic and medical council regulation on telemedicine and also we have Food and Drugs Administration regulation on online drugs prescription during pandemic and some of specific regulation that are still ongoing revised Chavez regulatory sandbox. Okay, that's all from me. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. That was very informational. I actually learned and I think also really a wonderful challenge that you have offered us as well, Erfin, because what you are really saying is that we have this opportunity and you are perfectly positioned with your law background and your IT background and your medical background. Um, but all of us as family physicians, the ethics of the next phase as we move into era 4.0, the ethics we need to think through and we need to advocate for our patients because otherwise these decisions will be made without our input and we have something very unique to say. Yeah, thank you. So thank that you. is very important. Thank you for that. All right, so now it is my pleasure next to invite from Mexico, Dr. Jose Alberto Loyo, who will be speaking on the family doctor's role in creating integrated care. We've heard about access to care. We've heard about, you know, telemedicine, telehealth. We've heard about the importance of mental health in all of this. And now really talking about integrated care of which the family doctor is really the center. So welcome Dr. Jose Alberto Loyo. It's all up to you. Well, thank you. Good day, everyone. 
So uh, we have been talking about integrated care here and well, we need to know exactly what it is before we continue on, mostly because it's a care that reflects a concern to improve patient experience and achieve greater efficiency and value from health delivery systems. Now, integrated care aims for the patient to be able to get every kind of attention in order for it to be uh, effective, okay? In this case, we are not aiming to cure, but to prevent everything. And in the given the case that the patient needs something that he or she or they could uh, afford it and get to it in the most efficient way. Now, the WHO defines it as an approach to strengthen people's center health systems through the promotion of comprehensive delivery of quality services. Now, um, these are all infographies that the WHO uh, gives us about quality healthcare. It must be effective. It, must be people-centered, it must be efficient, safe, timely, equitable, okay? And all of this is basically, uh, we are just repeating what we know is the family doctors, okay? The first contact doctors, we are those, okay? Now, the WHO acknowledges the importance of integrated care in its vision and global strategy for health services delivery. And many governments around the world are aiming to, to transform health systems in something that focus on primary care, on prevention, in order to reduce costs, okay, on the long term. Now, what role does the family specialist play in delivering integrated care? Well, we are basically the, 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 the foundings of all of this system, okay? Why? Because coordination of clinical care is complicated mostly because of the multiplicity of players involved and the first lines of authority among them. Now, many patients don't know who's in charge, don't know who to go, who to seek counsel with when they are sick or when they need something from the health uh, institution, okay? Now, uh, sometimes when they are in a consultation, patients think that they are in good competent hands, but what if, the doctors that give this attention to them, okay, also knows about their lives, also cares about what's happening. We must remember, we all must remember that we don't treat just illnesses. We treat patients with lives, with families, with problems and issues that they have to deal with every single day. And that's precisely the strength of the family doctors, of the family specialists here when creating integrated care. We need to let the patient know, okay, that he, she, or them are being hurt, are being treated, and we are paying attention to all of their issues because many, many health issues are not entirely health issues, talking about medicine, but also about mental, mental health. Now, uh, we have to work some points here that are basically communication between patients and clinicians, shared decision-making, alleviating discomfort, and emotional support and alleviation of fears and anxiety. Now, all of these points, we already work in primary health units or in primary health services, okay? We have to pay attention to them. Uh, again, I may be repeating myself uh, saying this, but the, the family doctors, the family specialists, okay, the primary care is vital for the creation of integrated care, because what we want is to give everything we can to those who need it, okay, but also to prevent every single aspect of any disease or of any action that could lead to greater costs, to harder uh, to find solutions to problems that could very easily be solved from the beginning, if only paying a little attention or perhaps uh, trying to make the patient feel comfortable so that they understand and follow the orders or indications that we give to them. Now, um, we are providing, we family physicians, a system of frontline health care, okay, like Dr. Otegi said before, uh, in Sierra Leone, in many countries, in Africa, Europe, Asia, okay, in, all around the world, we are there. We are in the first point of contact for patients to go. Those are us, the family physicians, the family doctors, okay? Our role is to try to integrate this, to let the patient know what they need to, to do, what they need to, to ask, where they need to go, when they need to do it, okay? To give all of this a proper um, 
recommendations in order for their health to be need at every point of their lives. And if they actually need something that must be hurried, that it's first, um, that it, it, it has this uh, importance, this greater impact, we, ha we have to let them know, okay? Now, emergency care, home and long-term care, all of these that we read here, okay, are the places where we family doctors, family specialists are, okay? We are everywhere. We are around the world and tending to patients everywhere we can because we want to do it. That's the reason why we are dedicating our lives, our work to this, okay? Now, um, during this pandemic, as we have heard before, we have been there in front of the patients, okay? We have been exposed to these health risks because it's part of our job, but we are doing that gladly and proudly, mostly because we are trying to do that. We are trying to prevent everything bad from happening. That's the reason why we, our role is so vital to this that I have been talking to you about, okay? So we have to protect ourselves. With, uh, the family specialists also have this particular thing that we have to be researching, we have to be studying, we have to be preparing ourselves even more for day-to-day -day, uh, challenges that we come upon, okay? Now, we not only deal, as I said before, with health issues, okay? We also deal with emotional uh, issues of the patient and we have to try to integrate, it, integrate those into the scientific um, background that we have here in, in, in our offices, okay? On a daily basis, we have to explain, we have to create all of these analogies, all of these explanations to the patients so that they understand that whatever they have, it's important. And we have to be uh, sure that our messages are getting to them, that we are not only speaking uh, to other doctors or to other health uh, specialists. No, 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 we're talking to patients, okay? We are trying to we integrate trying all of this into the consultation. Now, uh, according to the University of Washington, the clinical specialty of family practice is a patient-centered, evidence-based, family-focused, and problem-oriented, okay? We are way too used to deal with problems and solve them, okay? We try to focus, find a point where we can work with, and then we move on, okay? That's the role of the family physician here. We are the ones that solve problems. We are not only going to be solving them, but we also are aiming to try and provide every single tool the patient needs and that we can give to them in order for integrated care to become a reality. Very well, that would be all for me. Thanks for listening and well, that's it. Wonderful, so thank you very much. And I, I really love actually the integration of your presentation as well because as we go forward and develop people-centered healthcare, then having these concepts from the top down from the World Health Organization and combining that with what we know from our own community and our own experience and the grassroots of our patients, that is exactly, as you say, where we are. So thank you very much. That was another wake up and challenge to us all. Um, now, I would like you to come and invite you again to share your screen. I'm inviting Dr. Hanin Tahar, who is speaking from Jordan. Wonderful, she is so on top of it. Um, so that is great. And she is going to speak on the integrated care after COVID, specifically with a focus on women. She has real expertise and experience in this area. And she is, um, one of the up and coming family medicine trainees, a resident at the moment at the Jordan Ministry of Health. So, passing it on to you, Dr. Hani. Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you, Margaret, for this kind introduction. On behalf of Arazi Movement, I will talk about the impact of COVID 19 on women. We will assess the uh, many aspects of impact uh, on women across several key domains of life. We will talk about some of the ethical challenges that emerged during the pandemic and to talk about the policies and solutions that can be developed to meet the basic needs of vulnerable populations. Like the rest of the world, Jordan has been hit hard by the recent and ongoing crisis. 
and our government and Ministry of Health, they acted early in March 2020 by ordering a nationwide lockdown to cushion the impact of the uh, COVID-19 on healthcare system and spread, limit the spread of the infection. Actually, Jordan is surrounded by many countries of conflict. We are struggling to cope with the vast numbers of refugees and the tremendous pressure on the healthcare facilities. We experienced many difficulties, especially in terms of scarce health resources. And it appeared that the pandemic has created a situation that disproportionately having negative effect on women. And we will discuss some of these negative impacts that we faced during our work, either during the emergency or COVID facilities. First, uh, it increased the demand for caregiving as the result of joblessness and school closure women had to balance between homeschooling and taking care of sick people at home, plus working, doing their works and jobs from home. So it creates uh, stress and additional uh, conflict. Uh, we have seen many cases of depression and anxiety due to this increased demand. Uh, we know uh, there is good percentage of uh, healthcare workers, uh, they are women, about 67%, which exposed us to increase the risk of infection among frontline workers. When it comes to pregnant ladies, the pregnant ladies were found to be at heightened risk of more severe symptoms than people who are not pregnant. But pregnancy does not increase the susceptibility of the infection. Uh, we had many cases where the pregnant ladies refused the treatment and exposed, uh, exposed to radiation in order not to harm their babies. So it really uh, raised our concerns on their safety and the course of their disease among them. Uh, many studies were conducted to study the effect of uh, a pregnancy on the severity of COVID-19 on uh, pregnant ladies. Actually, uh, another uh, roadblock is the inability to access healthcare facilities and disruption the continuity of maternal and reproductive health services. In Jordan, 24% of ladies, they could not access healthcare facilities. Uh, many, uh, they were not able to gain the regular antenatal visits and we noticed increase in the uh, peripartum complication. It also increased the incidence of an issue that already exists before the pandemic, which is the intimate partner violence. We noted increase in the uh, uh, calls to the hotlines, uh, uh, reporting uh, uh, the percentage was 33%. Uh, reporting for abuse and intimate partner violence from women as opposed to men, which raised our concerns about their safety indoors. When it comes to the ethical challenges, COVID-19 has highlighted many. The government and healthcare system put difficult decisions and policies to allocate health resources, like deferral of elective surgeries, with resultant long-term ramifications and loss of organ function. Uh, limited access to the family planning methods and contraceptives due to lockdowns and shutdowns increased the cases of undesired pregnancy. Uh, we received many calls seeking for illegal abortion, which is banned in our country and uh, as well many countries. Uh, uh, so this is uh, uh, due to the lack, the accessibility to the contraceptive. In Jordan, actually, we uh, used to, the, uh, during the pandemic, we delivered the medication for chronic diseases to home, but this was not done uh, for the contraceptives. So we should pay attention to the basic reproductive health services. Policies regarding the prevention and the treatment of COVID-19 in the context of pregnancy demonstrate the ethical and legal, legal tension that is deep rooted in the maternal fetal diet, especially when it comes to the vaccination. Uh, a, a lot of uh, studies uh, were conducted to study the effect of uh, COVID uh, of vaccination uh, for pregnant ladies. Uh, and actually, uh, pregnant ladies were excluded from uh, many and uh, even all the clinical trials regarding the treatment and vaccination. 
all the results were connected uh, on animal studies. What we should do? We should actually, uh, we look forward to pay explicit attention to the role of women as a frontline health workers. We should provide them with appropriate size PPE. Uh, actually, uh, we noted that the PPE were of default man size and they were unfitting us, they were loose, so we were at increased uh, risk of exposure to the viral load. We should provide them with uh, essential hygiene, sanitation items. Uh, we should ensure the psychosocial support, either for the frontline healthcare workers or for the uh, pregnant ladies, for the uh, uh, infected uh, lactating mothers, how to deal with their infection and to uh, prevent uh, uh, transmitted this infection to, to, to their babies, at the same time uh, prevent the separation between the mother and the infant. We should ensure the continuity of maternal and reproductive health services by uh, providing the contraceptives, even in times uh, of lockdowns and complete shutdowns. And we should ensure the availability and accessibility of social agencies and family protection services all through the week, 24 seven, and hotlines to report for intimate partner violence. Uh, thank you for listening okay. and paying attention. Thank you. That was a really valuable and unique lens into the impact of COVID on women's health and amazing. Sometimes, you know, I wonder if it's just an oversight that somebody forgot about contraception. You know, it's easy to do, but how it really impacts so many women in Jordan. So thank you for all of that. And also as a family physician that was pregnant and had a baby during the COVID epidemic, I really um, relate to everything that you were saying. So that was very important. And now last, but certainly not least, I want to introduce Rohini um, Pasrikia, who is our family medicine medical student joining us from Canada, who is really has given so much already to her community um, as well as studying, unbelievable how she manages that, as well as supporting young doctors all over the world. And she is very active in our North American branch of Wonka, which is Polaris, which includes Canada, the United States and the Caribbean. Of course, we would love to have Mexico, but um, I, they are understandably associated with the Latin American and Spanish speaking area. But um, Rohini has done so much and now is going to speak about one of the important things because COVID, we, we know about its impact on our patients and the impact as um, Dr. Osden and Dr. Mia spoke about um, us and us as family physicians and as physicians. And so really looking at the, the impact on medical students is vital for us to look forward as well as to look back at what we can do. So handing it over to you, Rohini. Amazing. Thanks so much, Marguerite, for that kind introduction. So um, my name is Rohini Pasricha, and I'm a fourth year uh, Queen's medical student located in uh, Kingston, Ontario, Canada. And I've had the privilege to be part of uh, the Polaris chapter of Wonka over the last year and a half. And it's truly been an honor to see such uh, amazing things that everyone's been doing. So today, what I wanted to share with you is a bit of the medical student perspective on how uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted us. So um, as you can imagine, uh, each and every one of us uh, across the world have been hit hard by the COVID-19 pandemic in so many ways. As medical students, I remember back in March 2020, I was uh, leaving uh, my classmates for our March break and um, a pandemic was announced and we thought we weren't really sure what to expect. And we thought that we would be back in classes within a week or two, we're saying bye to our friends. Little did we know that a year would go by and we would be in a completely remote virtual curriculum. So three kinds of main areas that I want to talk about how COVID impacted us is first in the fact that curriculum was instantaneously restructured. We went from face-to-face uh, -face, uh, sessions of lectures, clinical skill sessions, observerships, where you could have hands-on contact with professors and other colleagues to a completely remote curriculum. The second thing that happened was that there were clinical placement delays. And uh, the, with the, the personal protective equipment shortages and lack of resources, as well as with the absolute chaos that was kind of coming in, 
students had to actually be removed from hospital rotations for a period of time. And as a result, there were some delays. And finally, you can imagine that being in this stressful environment, medical students, healthcare providers, frontline workers were all at increased risk for stress, anxiety, and having poor mental health. And all of these kinds of changes can have a toll on this, the mental health of medical students. So I just wanna kind of um, dig a little bit deeper each of these concepts. So with regards to the curriculum restructuring, we went from a completely face-to-face uh, -face model. Uh, at Queens, we have a very small community. Our uh, student population is only 100 people and we have small group sessions a couple times a week. And all of a sudden, we were go from the lectures to the hospitals, to observerships in the hospital environment, to sitting in front of our computers every single day for eight to nine, period, eight to nine hours a day. That combined with meetings online and lacking some social um, interactions, it can put a whole toll on sort of your energy um, and your overall um, kind of desire to want to uh, learn and engage in certain things. The idea of being able to do clinical placements and observerships was removed from this. And this was uh, uh, because of all the stress and chaos that had, that had been brought on by the pandemic and the amount of uncertainty. And as you can imagine in the early years, um, medical students are really, really keen on sort of getting their hands into the clinical environment and learning uh, what kinds of um, uh, specialties or, or um, areas of interest that they uh, really get an affinity to. And not being able to get that kinds of exposure um, can definitely be uh, quite, quite challenging for medical students when it uh, comes to making their decisions about, and learning about what kinds of things that they would like. And um, last but not least, but mo perhaps one of the most important things is the lack of social uh, interactions uh, that were that uh, were consequently, consequentially impacted as a result of the COVID pandemic. Being in a medical school environment, um, especially in a very close-knit community, you always have the opportunity to bond with your friends in class and outside of class, in um, extracurricular programs. We have a lot of sport teams and clubs that we do after um, the, the, the typical day. And that was all of a sudden all removed. And so our way of kind of uh, making sure that we're having a good uh, focusing on our physical, emotional, and mental health, that can all, as a result, be uh, impacted because of the COVID-19 pandemic and the need to socially distance and isolate ourselves. The next thing that I want to talk about is the clinical placement delays. And how that impacted us is that students were actually removed in Canada from the curriculum for a period of few man months. And this had a domino effect, not only on those students, but also the students in the years to come. Placements went from six week rotations to four week rotations. Uh, and this can be quite challenging in itself. The next thing that happened is the electives, the way to, so that you can learn about uh, different specialties and kind of uh, um, explore different locations and environments where you may want to practice that was quickly removed because of the need to kind of stay in one location and uh, avoid the transmission of COVID. Um, and so what that meant is for students who may be interested in specialties that may not be offered in their home school, that can definitely in, uh, increase and elevate the stress levels of those students. And uh, lastly, and I'm not, um, I'm speaking from a Canadian perspective, um, and I know that other countries ha had changes as well with regards to the residency match process, but our matching uh, interview process actually went from a complete in-person model to 100% remote. And while this has its benefits in terms of um, the, the cost, there's cost reductions with that and the reduction in carbon emissions, this can also be quite stressful on students as well because uh, it may limit their face-to-face -face interaction, their ability to kind of build rapport um, and learn about certain programs. And um, lastly, the thing that I want to talk about is in terms of the mental health, being on frontline worker, being medical students, studies have actually shown that um, each of these types of people are at increased risk for poor mental health, anxiety, depression, as well as at increased risk for um, uh, suicidal ideations and attempted suicide. And you can imagine that being in a very sort of uh, stimulating and stressful environment and uh, then combating all of the changes that are coming in with COVID, this only elevated some of the stress levels of many medical students. So speaking about the ethical concerns that kind of medical students were faced in the COVID pandemic, what I want to talk about is that as medical students, we have a very intense curriculum that we take part of 
for a certain number of years. And um, the, my, the beginning part is lecture format, and then you go into your hospital rotations. But um, medical students innately are uh, wanting to give back, volunteer, and are very altruistic in terms of uh, what they want to do for society. And a study in the National University of Ireland in 2019, when they looked at medical students, they asked the participants their willingness to volunteer if a pandemic should arise. 59% of them said that they were willing to volunteer, of which 81% of the participants said that they felt it was their moral obligation. And 98% attributed this to the most motivating factor being altruistic. What I, my reason for sharing this is that you can see that medical students really do want to volunteer. And so when the pandemic arose, I remember seeing many of my classmates wanting to uh, give back and see what they can do to help out. Things like building uh, personal protective equipment, helping out disadvantaged populations and picking up their groceries, um, holding daycares for frontline workers who couldn't take care of their kids because they still need to be there and doing research uh, to learn more about COVID-19. Everyone was trying to pitch in, but what's important to remember here is that um, there is that fine balance. And it's, it's important that while we're still, what I realized when reflecting on this, uh, the pandemic and sort of how medical students responded to it is that we were still in a full curriculum in terms of our lectures and needed to build all that knowledge base but at the same time, many uh, students wanted to still uh, volunteer. And the question is, is what is that balance? And if we're not careful enough, we can end up kind of overextending ourselves and over committing ourselves. And that can actually be detrimental to medical students from a learning perspective, but also to society if we're not able to actually build that skill set. And what I want to reflect on this for the future is is that we can't guarantee that a pandemic won't happen again. And I think it's really critical to um, actually put into our curriculum in our pre-clerkship or our clerkship curriculum, um, how to kind of combat and prepare for a pandemic in terms of resource allocation. What can medical students do? How can you uh, combat uh, burnout? And what can you do in terms of reaching out for help? And what can you do with the knowledge base you have without kind of overextending yourself um, and while still learning the things that you need to do to become a, um, uh, a medical doctor at the end of your four years. And the last thing I want to talk about is the importance of wellness days. And that's because in order for us to provide the best possible care to society, to our patients and um, uh, support our colleagues, that we need to still focus on our uh, mental health and physical and emotional well-being. And so having integrated into our curriculum uh, appropriate wellness days and sessions where you can take the time to reflect back on the things that you've done and the goals that you want to have for yourself in the future are really important. And so with that, I want to thank you all for your time. Um, and I look forward to answering any questions you may have at the end of the webinar. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Rohini. That was the perfect um, wrap up of everything. You really came back to the mental health, the importance of lifestyle medicine, the importance of how we manage our own minds. I want to thank all of the panelists for the very valuable um, lens which they brought and all of the content which they shared today. And I also want to thank you panelists and thank you to all the attendees for all that you do for yourselves, for your patients and for your community throughout this COVID pandemic and looking forward to, as you're saying, preventing burnout and preparing for future pandemics. And so looking after wellness, wellness in our communities, in our patient population and in ourselves. Um, I would like to now address some of the questions the webinar is um, designed to go for another 20 minutes, but ideally we would just go for another five to 10 addressing these questions. Um, I also again want to say my name is Ngozi Margarita Ezinwa. I am um, the YDM lead for Polaris and for the Young Doctors Movement of North America. And I am, um, I encourage you, I am, very open if anybody wants to reach out. If you look around to all of these panelists and you look around to your colleagues around you, you look to your patients, we need to, as Rohini said, we need to do this together. And the social interaction is really important. So now we are your community.
So please do not hesitate to reach out. And with that being said, everybody give a hand for the panelists. And now we can move to questions. Um, and again, Rohini Paresha, who as a medical student has been multitasking, has brought some of the things from the chats um, into questions. I've jotted down a few as well. And I also want to say that Rohini is the up and coming leader of Polaris as well. So um, I want to welcome her and I want to thank some of the outgoing leaders in the area, especially um, Arifin um, and Dr. Oteju as well. And I, there may be others among us. So I want to thank you all for your service. Right, questions. So one, which the first one actually, was about the fear. This is addressed to um, Dr. Oteju. Whether you could just speak for one or two moments about the fear of COVID, whether this was different to or similar to the fear of Ebola. And also there was a later question about cost, the cost to the patients of not addressing their non-communicable diseases in this time, um, and whether they're and the, the impact of absence from the clinics. I know that's a lot to answer. So we'll go to Dr. Otaju and then we'll open the floor to all the panelists. So you have about a minute to speak, Dr. Otaju. Thank you very much. Um, yes, concerning the fear, uh, the, on the first wave, actually the fear of um, COVID was quite high because there'd been a lot of anticipation, especially in my district, because like I said, I'm in the rural district and we did it, we were the last district out of um, eight to get hit by COVID and then our numbers just went up. So there'd been a lot of anticipation and fear coming. So after the first wave and we turned up about three months, Subsequently, the fear for Ebola was actually higher. And that was reflected even in the uptake for vaccination. Okay, because we realized, we found out that, you know, COVID kind of discriminated. It was affecting the elderly more and those who already had underlying illnesses. But Ebola didn't fear anybody. Okay, and then the symptoms of Ebola were so vivid as well. And it affected in the vaccination because now we also started are just about four weeks after the, the COVID vaccination started, Ebola vaccination also started in Sierra Leone, and we're having a higher uptake with the Ebola vaccination. So that's concerning the fear, all right? And then um, a lot of people were also recovering from COVID, even though we had some deaths, quite a number of deaths. But for Ebola, it was very bad. Most people that had it did recover. Then um, concerning the impact, oh yes, we did notice because now people weren't coming in for the regular, for the other illnesses, the acute illnesses, um, the, especially the HIV TB, you know, the chronic communicable illnesses. And when the, the restrictions, because of the restrictions, transportation and all of that, by the time those lifted up and people started coming back, people were coming in with complications. We had people coming in with worsening heart failure, and then for those who are on the, on the there's some people came in with resistance to the medication they've been on because they didn't come for their medications. And the community health workers that sometimes we used to send out there, sometimes it was difficult to reach them. So yes, there was com health costs concerning that. Okay. Wonderful, thank you. I want to open it up to the other panelists. And I also wanted to say, number one, a thank you to Dr. Brando Cantu and to Dr. Chloe Chan Lam, because they have patiently been translating whenever the need arises into Mandarin and into Spanish. If anybody does have a question and they want to type it in their own language, we will do our best to address that as well. <laughs> um, and we have many languages um, covered with our panelists. So thank you, Dr. Oteja. That was a really comprehensive answer. Would anybody else like to speak to either of those questions? So I would like to say here in North America that the impact of non-communicable diseases on their um, 
coming back to the clinic has been huge. So people did not come to have their diabetes or their hypertension addressed for some for over a year. And despite the rise of telehealth, some people have more affinity to telemedicine than others. And some of our lovely grandmothers and grandfathers and great grandmothers simply don't have the ability to you know, interface um, with telemedicine at this stage. So it has been a huge challenge and now we're playing catch up. Does anybody else want to speak to this? All right, I am going to open a can of worms now because I first would invite Dr. Kinley Bhutti to speak to this question because it was really in response to her talk, um, that the response to vaccination. After this, I'm going to go around and ask each person the response in their context to vaccination because even, I mean, where I am, it has been very mixed. So Dr. Kinley, up to you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh... <clears throat> Dr. Margarita, uh, the vaccination of the first vaccination, we received COVID shield from government of India, which covered whole of the population in March, 2020, where our country had a mass uh, rollout of vaccine campaign. But then we were supposed to receive the second dose by the uh, end of June, that is considering the eight to 12 week uh, gap. But because our, the, our uh, neighbor, the, India was having, uh, was, was very much in trouble because of the overwhelming increasing number of COVID patients and the rising trend of the deaths. We were not able to receive the second dose from government of India because they were in need themselves. But our government explored various other measures to receive the second dose. So uh, on the second week of this month, our country is very lucky to receive various uh, vaccination, uh, vaccines from the, um, I think from uh, Germany, we received several doses and from government of China. And also, uh, we, so this time we received uh, mainly uh, Moderna. So Moderna, <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, um, the pronunciation is a little different. So. So our country is considering the mixed mode of vaccination. So most of the people are going for Moderna, but some people, but our country were very, uh, the people were very lucky that we have an option to uh, receive AstraZeneca also since we have some of the vaccines received from other countries. Uh, I'm Thank not sure you. That. And um, most... Are most people wanting to be vaccinated? And were most of the first vaccines, were they Pfizer rather than Moderna? Oh, no, the first vaccine was Covishield. Covishield, also, I think that's the same as AstraZeneca produced by the government yes. of India. So most of the people are uh, in the first of the eligible ones, almost 95% of the eligible population were vaccinated in the first vaccine rollout. And till now, today is the fifth day of the second vac national vaccine campaign rollout. So we have almost 80% uh, of our population vaccinated. So it's mainly because our country is a small country, which has a very strong belief in our His Majesty the King, who has far-sighted knowledge on the pandemic, and also our prime minister, who is also a doctor. So our pe people, maybe it's because of the uh, strong belief in the government and our king that people have come forth to take the vaccination on their uh, willingness. Thank you. Interesting. Thank you very much. And I did not know that your prime minister was a doctor. Thank you. That is very interesting. What have other people's experience been with their population and whether people want to be vaccinated? I invite the panelists to speak and attendees can type in the chat. So just as a bit of a Canadian perspective, um, I think that uh, as uh, Dr. Bhutti was saying as well, there is a bit of a mix. Um, currently in Canada, around 70 just over 70% of people have had one uh, vaccine dose, of which about 55% now are around double vaccinated. Um, so when, um, I think the main thing in Canada is that um, there, there can definitely be fear. 
and sort of fear of the unknown is what I want to call it, uh, where we don't have the uh, education and the knowledge uh, about certain things. Sometimes we can uh, perhaps make assumptions or uh, listen to whatever we hear first. And I think that um, the having sort of the important education and the knowledge where people can make uh, their decisions uh, has been very helpful. Um, it just sort of to give you a bit of a timeline on how things kind of rolled out. So it, the Pfizer and the Moderna um, kind of came out first in Canada and uh, AstraZeneca was soon to follow. And um, uh, there was, when it started off, it was uh, given to those from um, vulnerable populations, those being in like the long-term care homes uh, to try to limit the transmission of spread there as well as to our frontline workers. And there was a four week gap between when you could get your first dose of Pfizer and Moderna to your, your next dose. And um, that was uh, changed shortly after from extending the gap. And I know that that created some fear as well uh, for, and some hesitations for uh, some of um, Canadians. And then as well as uh, it was announced that um, mixing of the um, AstraZeneca with a Pfizer or Moderna uh, was approved in Canada. And so some people um, went ahead with it. And then I know that some people as well were a bit concerned about that and have waited as a result. But overall, um, quite a few people are, are um, positive towards getting the vaccine. And I think that um, having ed the education and sort of constant awareness about what's going on and uh, what are the, the benefits. And of course, making sure that people understand that there are risks with everything too. Um, so that people can make an informed decision has been very helpful. Thank you. What are other people's experience in their own country? I would like to talk. I am. Please. Okay, I am Hanin Musa. I would like to talk about our experience uh, of uh, vaccination in Jordan. Uh, actually, it uh, first introduced by the end of uh, December 2020. Uh, as Dr. Rohini said, people, they responded differently. Uh, a lot of fears were raised. Uh, a lot of rumors were uh, spread around uh, regarding the side effects of vaccination. So uh, people, they were uh, reluctant to uh, accept the vaccination. Uh, at the, our Ministry of Health, they designed a platform and through which we can register to take the uh, vaccine. They pri uh, prioritized the vaccination. First, they uh, it were given to, uh, to the healthcare workers and elderly with comorbidities. They were prioritized uh, over other uh, uh, a population. Uh, vaccines, they were Sinopharm and uh, Pfizer. Uh, they were given, uh, like the, as we know, two doses. The interval was uh, three weeks, but they extend the dose interval later on. Uh, then, uh, actually, it, it turns rapidly. Uh, a lot uh, of people, they uh, are vaccinated now, almost uh, four millions. Uh, of uh, our population, they are vaccinated. Uh, response, it's nice now. They are uh, reassured uh, from the, when they share experience of each other. So they uh, get reassurance from sharing experience and they respond uh, uh, nicely now to the vaccination. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. I can um, share that here in the United States, um, our vaccination, our completion of vaccination rate is only 53%. So Bhutan is doing a lot better than us, <laughs> despite the fact that we have access to many of these vaccines. We did a tiered approach as well, depending on um, acuity and need with healthcare providers near the um, forefront and non-communicable disease and then by age as well. Um, and we have access to the Pfizer, Moderna, the Johnson & Johnson, the AstraZeneca. Um, but there have been a lot of mixed messages and is actually the underserved populations within the United States that have the lowest vaccination rates, who arguably are the 
populations which need it the most. So African American, um, Latino, and um, low income populations are the ones who have the lowest vaccination rates. So it is an ongoing challenge and the messaging um, has been really important. I think it's really important for people to hear from us as family physicians and as trusted healthcare workers also our opinion of the, the vaccines. Yes, Dr. Oteju. Okay, yes, like I said earlier, our Ebola vaccine was rolled up a few weeks after the COVID vaccine because we also had an Ebola outbreak in the neighboring country just after the COVID, first COVID wave. And the uptake for that is so much you know, higher. Now, the numbers we have so far for Sierra Leone is 1%. Just 1%, yes, of the, of the population has been vaccinated. It started with the healthcare workers as well, all right? And even among the healthcare workers, there were so many rumors and uh, you know, a lot of myths and hearsays. And we were, even I, I must confess, we were a bit skeptical, especially because, you know, it's a new technology. And um, also, uh, you know, so we had Sinopharm and AstraZeneca available. And many of us actually decided to go for the Sinopharm because it was, the, it was using the old method, okay? Basically, so compared to the DNA. But most of the healthcare workers still got it. So again, we come back to the access because we didn't have, we don't have so many vaccines available for the population because they were all donated. But even for those that were donated, a lot of people were reluctant. So right now we're about 1% vaccinated. Thank you. Yes, Jose. Well, uh, here in Mexico is kind of surreal because uh, in rural, rural areas, uh, population wants to be vaccinated. They, they look forward to, to the vaccine. Now, we started with the CanSino and the Pfizer BioNTech, and we've continued with the BioNTech uh, vaccine as well as AstraZeneca and Sinovac. Uh, in Mexico City, they actually have AstraZeneca, BioNTech, Pfizer, uh, and uh, Sputnik. But it's like I said, it's surreal because in the cities, a lot of people have, have lots of fears, unfounded fears, and there are even doctors, the medical community is like divided into those that are telling the population to get the vaccine, to get vaccinated and take care. And the other half is uh, um, telling them that they have to be careful, but they should, X or Y do regarding the vaccine because of the side effects. Now, at least in my population, the state of Veracruz, that is south of the country, elder people, older people want to be vaccinated. They look forward to it. Almost 70% of the population above 50 years is already vaccinated. But talking about young adults from 18 to about 45 or 49 years, we've only vaccinated 32% of the population so far, and not because there haven't been enough campaigns. I mean, there have been very mishaps regarding that, but no, they, 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 there's people that they don't want to, like they are just waiting for this to, to, to go away suddenly out of nowhere. And that's where we family doctors are trying to insist and convince them that it's totally safe, that it's really, really recommendable for them to do it. And in order for them to take care of their loved ones, they should actually do it. So it's, it's, a, it's an ongoing battle that we have against these beliefs and these fears that the patients have. Thank you. It's so true in so many different ways. Yes, we have one minute. So um, Arifin or Asden, both of you, if you would like to contribute, that would be great. Yeah, please, Dr. Thank you Alden. very much. Uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, I just agree with my colleagues because, uh, yes, in Turkey, there was Sinovac, first of all, and the um, healthcare workers just vaccinated uh, two doses. Afterwards, BioNTech just came into the stage, and now uh, some of us, and also uh, the, the ones who has got priority about the ages and also the teachers and so on, now uh, being vaccinated. Sputnik is just 
just a question mark because the, the government says that this will be just in the, the new stage uh, that will come, but uh, not again, uh, no shot has been done uh, so far, but maybe this could be. So we were a little bit much more lucky to have some more options to, for the vaccination. Uh, but as my colleague said, uh, the same thing is just going in our country too. Uh, but uh, the, the citizens are just getting their appointments and just the vaccinations could be done in the hospitals and also the family health care centers. So that's the chance for you. That's the chance for us. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, maybe thank you, thank maybe you I just much. want to add. I just want to add a little bit about Indonesia. So uh, there is 21 percent of our population that, uh, who have been vaccinated, uh, and they have got the first doses and the second uh, doses. Uh, are on, uh, there, 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 there only there is only eight percent of our population uh, who have been vaccinated for the second doses. And our target is 165 uh, million people uh, who will be vaccinated. And uh, we have 270 million people in Indonesia. And we ha also have the same problems with any other countries, especially uh, based on religion <laughs> issues. <laughs> so it's all about conspiracy theories. We, we also have that problem. Generally, we know that 76% of the vaccines are, are being used in uh, at, in uh, high economic countries, when low middle, mid, low middle income countries are just getting 16% of the doses. So that's the problem of, I, I mean, the that is a problem. huge problem. Yeah. yeah. You are okay. Thank you. Thank right. you, Margaret. Yeah. Yes. No, I really appreciate it. And you are absolutely right. And what a perfect place to really close because I think that the ethics of vaccine distribution and a vaccine uptake illustrate everything that we have spoken about today. And again, I thank you all for being here, both attendees and panelists. This is a phenomenal community and I really think that together we can shape the future, not only of family medicine, but of the global approach to an, a pandemic like this. So thank you all and good morning, good day, good afternoon and good night to you all. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you.